sorry for the delay. Uh, our speaker today is Joy Romanski from NASA Guests and in their joint program with Columbia University. So Joy did her undergraduate studies at Hunter College in the uh, City University of New York and for her PhD she went to Columbia University and worked with William Rossow. And her thesis topic is actually what she is going to discuss today. Uh, uh, the various ways, the various forms of diabetic heating that contribute to the available potential in energy. <coughs> a basic topic in atmospheric science, so I think it will be very educational for all of us. Uh, after her PhD, uh, Joy is involved in a very interesting and ambitious program on studying how mid-latitude cyclones uh, uh, impact uh, energy fluxes uh, uh, in the atmosphere and the ocean in, different, in the Mediterranean and, and then more recently in the Atlantic Ocean. But today she's going to speak on heating processes in the atmosphere. So let us welcome John. Thank you. Hi everyone. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, Scott, hello. Nice to see you. Uh, thanks for coming. Today we're going to talk about contributions of individual atmospheric diabetic heating processes to the generation of available potential energy. Uh, this is work that I did as part of my thesis. Uh, and uh, a preview for later, I added some extra topics that I covered in my thesis but were not uh, in the publication of these results, uh, where we looked at the same processes in CMIT 3 uh, model output and tried to get a sense of whether you could relate climate sensitivity to uh, processes with effect G. Uh, so I may run through my slides from this talk a little bit faster, so we have more time at the end. So please stop me uh, either now or later if you have any questions about anything that I cover precisely. So uh, the previous structure prior to the addition of new material was I'll tell you a little bit about G, the generation of available potential energy in the atmosphere, uh, what causes it, how we computed it, how each diabetic heating term contributes to G, uh, the role of clouds in altering G, and we'll draw some conclusions about how the large scale circulation organizes itself in order to maintain itself via its influence on G. Uh, so, basic review of the Lorenz energy cycle. Ed Lorenz, in 1955, conceived of the flow of energy through the atmosphere as beginning with A, available potential energy, which is the energy available for conversion to motion, that is, the potential energy in excess of a statically stable barotropic atmosphere. So you know that, um, let me go through here. So you know that the isotropes in the atmosphere curve upward toward the poles, basically. Equator, here are the poles. So um, available potential energy is uh, defined as energy in excess of rearranging this picture, such that it's, these are flat, so there's no area where potential, uh, where mass is higher than other areas. It occurs when there's a temperature gradient. Warm air in the equator extends, and it puts more mass higher up in the atmosphere, creating potential energy, so the mass can then slide down that gradient, creating kinetic energy. Uh, available potential energy may be decomposed into zonal and eddy components. Uh, investigations of all the um, Quantities here show that the direction of flow is generation of zonal mean available potential energy by heating at the equator and cooling at the pole. Uh, that available energy may be converted to any available potential energy by meridional induction uh, of temperature gradients, such that now you have a longitudinal temperature gradient, which then powers any motions, any kinetic energy. And both the available zonal mean available potential energy and uh, any kinetic energy feed the main flow zone only kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is dissipated through frictional dissipation. And uh, the topic of today's talk is the generation of available potential energy, which occurs when warm areas are heated or cool areas are cooled. In particular, we're going to focus today on G, total G and its components, and its relationship to the general circulation. G is the covariance between deviations from mean heating and temperature. And it's created, as I said, when warm areas are heated or cold areas are cooled. There are three main diabetic heating terms which contribute to G. Latent heating, 
radiated heating and surface natural heat flux. A spatial distribution of each of the heating terms depends on the circulation of the atmosphere so that each heating term is able to alter the circulation by factoring B. And that will be the topic of our talk today. We're going to describe B due to each component in detail and we'll show how the circulation is organized in such a way as to maintain itself by a G. So there have been estimates made in the past of these terms, DZ and DE. Uh, Lorenz felt that DZ should be about 3 watts per meter squared, all of these units are watts per meter squared. Uh, Peugeot Lorenz's work later on estimated GZ to be about 1 watt per meter squared. More recently, there have been uh, analyses done using reanalysis of this act. Uh, they find that GZ varies between about 1.65 and 1.85 watts per meter squared. So there's not a lot of disagreement <coughs> currently as to the magnitude of GZ. However, the same cannot be said for GE. Lorenz thought it should be negative. Most other researchers since then have found it to be positive, uh, but there's a lot of variability in magnitude. Uh, in particular, a recent study by Kim and Kim, uh, where they estimated, using, estimated GE using a MERA, a analysis, uh, distinguished between the GE due to stationary eddies and the GE transient eddies and found that the stationary eddy GE is positive and the transient eddy GE is negative, um, which is something that we'll come back to later. Uh, all of these estimates have been derived uh, as residual in the energy budget, and so they don't tell us about the contributions from each set at a heating term, which is the topic of today's talk. So how did we compute GZ and GE? We use the equation for the approximate form of G given by Lorenz. Uh, the exact form of G depends on heating um, multiplied by the efficiency factor, uh, which is determined by the deviation of pressure, local pressure from average pressure on an isotrope. Uh, but because observations are regularly taken at exotropic levels, uh, we instead use the approximate form of G, uh, which depends on a deviation of temperature and heating from uh, their averages on isobaric surfaces. And GZ is the product of deviation from <coughs> low mean or zonal mean temperature and heating. And GZ is the same by 480 quantities, deviations from zonal mean. Uh, both are scaled by a static stability parameter, gamma, which depends on the flux rate and temperature, so that heating which occurs in a stable atmosphere is more efficient at generating available potential energy. So what do the equations mean? So the stability uh, is, is it a uh, global mean or is this sort of a local? It's global mean, and we'll talk about that later. That does affect the result. There have been studies that show and we did some sensitivity analyses uh, in response to questions about that. Yes, they make a difference. Um, so what does this mean? We have here, we have an uh, equator pole temperature rating is pretty much always of the sign. It may be a sharper or uh, less sharp gradient, but it's always this sign. We can have heating that has the same sign temperature rating, so this is more warming at a warm place and more cooling at a cold place in the pole. And these are the same sign gradients, and this enhances GZ. We can have a situation with an opposite sign heating gradient, as before our temperature rating always looked like this, but now we have cooling where the temperatures are warm and warming, relative warming, where the temperatures are cool. These are opposite sign temperature gradients, heating gradients, and suppresses GZ. We may also have a situation that looks like this, where we have our, once again, our temperature gradient, but this time our heating gradient has mixed positive and negative uh, correlations with the temperature gradient. In this case, there would be a net enhancement because there's more positive than negative, but that can vary depending on season and Hemisphere. You've drawn those as more or less symmetric around the equator, but presumably that yes. is not. It is not true. Well, we have pictures later to show that these are just schematics to illustrate the basic point. But yeah, in the annual mean, the annual mean uh, values kind of look kind of like this, uh, but seasonally, yes, they, they are quite different. So, what data did we use to compute our uh, GZ? I'll go through this quickly, and if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask me. 
Um, we use Greeley to process from the ISCCP FD data set. And ISCCP FD produces long wave and short wave radiative fluxes, which are derived from inputting uh, observations on atmospheric constituents, temperature, and surface properties into the SGC radiative transfer code. Uh, they're available at the surface, uh, 680 millibars, 680, uh, 440 millibars, 100 millibars, and above. Uh, so that was what determined our four uh, levels for our analysis. Precipitation is from GBCP, a one degree daily data set that's a merged microwave, infrared, and green beam based uh, product. Uh, we had no vertical information for the heating other than uh, in the tropics where we have trips that we needed global. Uh, so we tested a variety of different measures and we found that the best results were obtained by portioning the latent heating uh, throughout the column according to the cloud amount in that column. Our surface sensible heat fluxes are merged three data sets. We use the microwave-based uh, GSSTF data set over ice-free ocean. Uh, we use the GLDAS uh, land uh, model. It's in a simulation where they input uh, properties of the surface and near surface atmosphere uh, into a land surface model and generate turbine fluxes. Uh, and so we use that for land north of Antarctica and for all other places where we didn't have these two we use the SMX target analysis. Our temperature are from top sounding. Uh, we used the ISCCP portion, which has the temperatures interpolated to the ISCCP levels, and also the most missing data with uh, climatology uh, can be interpolated. Our study covers the years 1997 to 2000. There's nothing special about those years. Those were the longest overlapping years in all of these input data sets at the time we did the study. Uh, there's since been uh, more data from GSSTF uh, past 2000, so you could uh, repeat this with more data if you wish. Our data are daily resolution, a two and a half degree lat one grid, and we feel that that time space resolution is important, particularly for computing PV, which depends on synoptic uh, motion. And we have four atmospheric levels. We have the lower troposphere, the middle troposphere, the upper troposphere, and above. Just a clarification. Uh, for the latent heating, uh, mm -hmm. you said the proportions are proportions by cloud amount, but if you have high cloud, uh, how do you get sort of the different levels? Because if you have high cloud, then it covers the other levels. So, uh, so well, now they have cloud set, which is okay. providing better results, but we didn't have cloud yeah, set when we did the study. So what they did, uh, Bill Rosso produced a vertical structure data set for radio sun data, radio sun sounding. That he used to turn. It's also used in the uh, ICCP FD data set. So they have to know where the clouds are for FD. So he used his uh, radio sun based uh, cloud vertical structure ontology for that. But yes, that's definitely something that can be improved on. And we tested the effect of locating the heat heating uh, in one of our sensitivity analyses. But yeah, that, that, the, the, this is the crudest thing our, our study. Definitely. Segwaying nicely to our uncertainty analysis, uh, each of the input data sets that we use has errors and biases associated with it. Uh, so we wanted to figure out what that would do to our results. So we devised a series of synthetic data sets in which we altered the inputs uh, to GZ and GE according to what we thought were the most serious errors that were likely to affect our results. And this fell into four different categories. Uh, the first category is latitudinal gradient errors. We call them that GZ and GE depend on gradient of temperature and heating. Um, we know that GPCP underestimates precipitation by about 10 to 15 percent globally. Uh, we know the uncertainty of GPCP is largest at uh, high latitudes, so we thought worst case scenario for our results would be if all of that underestimates took place in the pole. So we created a synthetic data set in which this was the case and computed GZ and GE using that. We know that uh, top soundings don't see the temperature absorption in northern polar regions in winter, so that surface temperatures and near surface temperatures are too warm. So we tend to do that. Too warm surface temperatures in the pole would also cause too large radiative fluxes in the same place. So we tested the effect of that error. Uh, we also know that vertical gradient errors can have a big effect on our GC in particular. Uh, one is the error that we were talking about before. Our latent heating apportionment scheme uh, puts the tropical latent heating peak too high. Comparison with trim sounding suggests that it may be a couple of hundred millibars 
higher than it should be. So we tested that. And we also know that ICCP is a top-down uh, view. And so that because incorrect uh, vertical profile of latent feeding, including too little radiated from the a lot, too much about the lower curvature. So we tested that as well. Uh, our merging of the three data sets for surface fluxes make puzzle man water surface flux bias. Each data set has its own uh, biases and errors. So we tested that. So those are the errors due to the input data. And then there's a methodological error. Uh, we used the approximate form, uh, which is not the same as the exact form. And the largest uh, potential error resulting from that is using uh, the global mean static stability parameter to compute from global mean mass rate and global mean temperature. Uh, researchers uh, Dutton, Jensen, and Stigman have shown that this uh, doesn't have much of an effect on mean GZ, but that it can change the balance between tropical and polar contribution. Uh, in particular, uh, the use of the global mean static stability parameter causes one to underestimate the tropical upper temperature contribution and overestimate the lower temperature polar contribution. But I don't understand why you, you do that. So why you not, what, what conceptual difficulty not to use a global? I'm sorry, we, we chose to use the exact, uh, sorry, not the exact, the same approximate form that other people have used. Yeah, because but they didn't have computer back then, so they had to. But uh, well, uh, there have been a lot of other studies using the same equations that we used, and we wanted our results to be comparable to those. So we felt that it was worth incurring this potential error source in order to have our results comparable. But in fact, GC has been, and G have been computed in many different ways using many different analytical equations by different researchers over the years. So it's basically for historical re reasons. But yes, you're right. So summing up all of these possible errors, uh, we conclude that we may have overestimated GZ uh, by about 20 to 35 percent, and that our DE is probably not negative enough by 10 to 25 percent. So keeping those in mind, here are our seasonal and atmospheric means, and we'll talk about what those mean to be later. We see that GZ is positive, as expected, because it's the basic input of energy to the circulation. The global annual mean is 1.52. It's larger in the winter than in the summer. You can see winter and summer. And particularly in the southern hemisphere, we'll talk about why that is. GE is negative. It's an order of magnitude smaller than GZ, and we'll see later that that's due to cancellation of the terms of the opposite sign. And we have our December, January, and February, in July and August, contributions of individual diabetic feeding times to GZ. Uh, this and all subsequent uh, zone mean plots are area weighted. Uh, so, uh, so we see here uh, the total is the solid curve, just like this. Precipitation is the dashed line for the heated. Radiative fluxes are the dotted line, and the dashed dot is surface fluxes. Uh, we see from looking at this uh, surface flux contribution is mainly positive. The radiative contribution is mainly negative, and the latent feeding contribution varies in latitude. Another thing to note here is that all of the contributions from all the different terms are roughly the same magnitude. And maxima in GZ are attained in the high latitude winter, particularly in the southern hemisphere. All three terms are active together, but the most important term is the surface fluxes, and next is the latent feeding. Maxima are also attained in the summer tropics, mainly due to latent feeding. Minima in GZ are attained in the winter tropics uh, due to both radiated heating and latent heating. And in the summer mid latitudes, primarily due to radiated heating in the northern hemisphere, and uh, both radiated heating and latent heating in the, in the southern hemisphere. So, one thing that we noticed when we did this was that surface sensible heat fluxes turned out to be a lot more important than we had thought they would be, uh, given their comparatively small magnitude. So we devised a statistic called the yield, which tells us how effective each diabetic feeding term is at altering G. So here's our daily mean yield, yield computed from the daily mean statistic times 100. So all of the yields are actually really small. The X is not very efficient at turning heating into potential energy. Yield is defined as the absolute value of the generation due to one particular diabetic term, feeding term scaled by the uh, global mean of that term. And what it tells us here is that surface sensible heat fluxes are much more effective 
and generating uh, available potential energy and then late heat or late heat uh, just to look at the uh, raw magnitudes of these heating zones. You see that the surface sensibility box is much smaller, yet much more important. So why might that be? GZ depends on the latitudinal gradients for temperature and heating. So up here we have temperature. This is zonal mean temperature. This is DJF and this is JJA. Uh, so you see these uh, those cartoon plots that I showed before from, uh, would represent kind of an end of mean of these two. Uh, this top curve is the lower troposphere temperature. This is the middle troposphere temperature, and this is the upper troposphere temperature. And down here we have surface sensible heat flux. Uh, this is the northern uh, pole. This is the southern pole. And what we notice here is that the strong gradient in sensible heat flux at the winter pole occurs at the same place as the strong gradient in temperature. So we have a strong uh, positive correlation between temperature and heating gradients and we have strong DC production. Now contrast that in the situation with uh, latent heating in the upper troposphere. These are the same temperature curves as before. But instead, the solid curve down here is upper troposphere latent heating. And you see that there's intense heating in the summer tropics, but that this heating occurs in a region where the temperature gradients are small. So despite the very high magnitude of heating, it's not very effective at generating available potential energy. So the reason why surface sensible heat fluxes are so effective despite their small magnitude is that they occur in the lower troposphere, where diabetic heating produces GZ most effectively because of the larger temperature gradients there. So what about GE? Let's look at the individual contribution to zonal mean GE. This is DJF, this is JJA. As before, the total is the solid. Precipitation is the dotted line. Uh, sorry, the dashed line. Radiative flux. The dotted line and surface fluxes are the uh, dashed dot. And we see that uh, throughout most of the uh, latitudes, uh, GE is negative, uh, particularly uh, here. Subtropics, uh, the uh, sorry, the winter hemisphere. Uh, positive GE uh, occurs in high latitudes in the winter, and and in the uh, northern hemisphere, summer subtropics, where latent heating and surface sensible heat fluxes together combine to overpower the negative contribution from radiation, which takes place throughout all latitudes. In particular. You see this peak here, this is northern hemisphere of winter, and mid latitude, this is late heating due to the mid latitude storm track. And you see here, this is the Indian monsoon in the summer, uh, the large contribution to GE there, and, and the subtropics is due to the late heating, the monsoon, and the surface heat fluxes, subtropical desert. You see that the small values that we saw before in the hemispheric means of GE are due to the cancellation in terms of opposite sign, the larger kind of dew. We can especially see that when you look here, the spatial variability of the individual contribution to GE. These, uh, you probably can't see these numbers, but this is negative 5, and this is 5 plus per meter squared. So those are the same magnitudes that we were seeing for GZ, but they cancel largely, in the, even in the zonal mean. This is the total GE. This is GE due to radiative flux, summer, January, February. This is the GE due to late heating, and this is the GE due to surface sensible peak flux. And what we see here, is that the mean pattern is obtained by adding these two, the radiative flux and the latent heating, and they don't exactly cancel each other out, so we get this pattern of positive and negative, and the surface fluxes reinforce the pattern. Um, one other thing to note here is that in the tropics, despite uh, large zonal and asymmetric heating associated with the Walker circulation, GE is small because the temperature gradients in the tropics are small. Uh, in, um, back? Yeah, it's quite a bit long. Uh, can you go back one? Uh, uh, yes. Yes. I noticed that the, the latent heat can actually doesn't generate any available potential energy in the specific storm trap, which seems to be strange. No, the, 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 the West Pacific is sort of negative there. Because you, you always think that in cyclones, the yes. it's rising warm air and that's where the precipitation is. And it, you see this in the 
Atlantic storm trap, but not into the huge storm trap, which looks sort of scary. Yeah, that, that, that doesn't. Remember that these are deviations from the zone. Uh -huh. So it's not that it doesn't. There's, it's not that there's no heating there. It's just that the heating there is less than the zone heating. But if you look at presentation, it's actually that there, are, there are two peaks. You can actually see oh, both storm yes. tracks. Yes. Uh, the, even if you look at deviation from the normal mean. So that, that just sort of strikes me as strange. Mm -hmm. Instead, you have to be largely the detail on the, uh, on the uh, eastern Siberia, which is pretty strange. Yeah, so, uh, we, we can discuss it later. Probably will be more positive. Uh, I don't know. The latent, at least the latent heat one would be more positive. 
Oh, we found that at least when we went from daily to monthly, and we found the latent heating didn't change that much because most of the effect was due to the, the quadrant station procedure, not the transient waves. But it would be interesting to see what happens in the southern hemisphere in particular. We don't get that kind of uh, long, longer lasting kind of. That would be a very interesting analysis to do. So, thank you for suggesting that. So, we wanted to, effect, to focus especially on the effect of clouds on circulation. The need and eddy circulation have motions which produce clouds, and those clouds then alter the radiative heating, and in doing so, alter G by a very intense and the radiative component of G. So this table presents a, a comparison between GZ and GE computed using cold sky radiative fluxes, and GZ and GE computed using clear sky radiative fluxes. The clear sky radiative fluxes are the same fluxes from ICCPFD without a cloud. So the other atmospheric constituents are the same, the temperature is the same, the surface is the same. So in no way does that represent what a cloud-free atmosphere would look like. Uh, this can be thought of more as the instantaneous influence of clouds on the radiative component of GZ and GE. So when we do that, so this is the this here the uh, column totals for uh, all radiative for all radiative heat components of the clear sky. GZ, and this is a percent change from the full sky. So we see. Okay. And so we see that without clouds, GZ is much lower. It's about 75% lower in the global annual mean, but it can be as much as more than 150% lower uh, in certain seasons and hemispheres. Uh, it's particularly small in the spring and summer, and we'll talk about why that is later. We see also that taking out the clouds uh, from the radiative fluxes affects GZ. It lowers GZ, but not by as much as GE. I'm sorry, it lowers GE, but not by as much as GZ. Only about 15 to 20 percent in the global annual mean, but can be as much as 50 percent in the northern hemisphere winter. But without clouds, it's just smaller. Could you go back to the slide? The table? I don't follow the first, the first bullet, especially when, when you look at the summer values. Uh, uh, that's smaller. They are smaller in Hoste, but that doesn't make the GZ smaller. Can you say that again? For the June, July, and the, and the August, when I look at the, the value, that does not make, make it necessarily smaller. I'm uh, looking at the change, the percent change in the GZ. In June, July, and August? Yes. In which hemisphere? We say take take the northern hemisphere and they compare it and they compare it to DJS. I see, yes. So why is that uh, you say it's small? It's oh you're right. I'm oh, sorry. That's an error. I apologize. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes, you're right. It should be winter. Okay? Thank you. Not later. So here we have, so why is that? How do clouds change the vertical and latitudinal profile of GZ? We have DJF mean, full sky minus clear sky, GZ, applied as a function of latitude. Uh, this is the northern polar region, southern polar region, and height. Uh, the dashed line is the lower troposphere, the dotted line is the middle troposphere, the dashed dot is the upper troposphere. And the first thing that we notice is that clouds enhance GZ in the summer tropics uh, throughout all levels of the atmosphere, but particularly in the middle and lower troposphere. And also we see that clouds enhance GZ at the poles, particularly in the winter poles. Uh, they, in fact, suppress GZ in the lower troposphere, but greatly enhance GZ in the middle troposphere, and a little bit enhance in the upper troposphere, thus having an effect of moving GZ production upper from the surface to the mid-level. Clouds suppress GZ in the subtropics, but not by very much, so overall. Clouds radiative effect on GZ strengthens the circulation. So these cartoons explain why that happens. Recalling that GZ depends on latitudinal temperature.
for a heating radiant. Here we have a cartoon representing the temperature gradient and the radiative heating gradient in the lower troposphere. It's sort of a stone mean feature, but uh, sort of an annual mean feature. So you would move the heat over a little bit, as we saw for the season. Uh, we see that these are opposite sign gradients, meaning that GB is negative, and available potential energy is destroyed. But when we compare the same figure uh, with clear sky radiative thermal mean heating, that's the dotted line here, and we see that there's even more cooling without clouds attracting, making this gradient even larger magnitude and being more effective at destroying available potential energy. So what's going on with the clouds that make that happen? So we have in the cloudy case, we have less cooling from the middle and lower troposphere levels, and we have only cooling from the upper level, the top of the cloud, where temperatures are colder. We have less cooling in general, and less cooling in particular from these regions in the lower and middle troposphere where temperature gradients are large. You see here in this picture, without the clouds, we have more cooling, and it comes from lower in the atmosphere. So in the tropics, clouds spread radiative cooling from the lower and middle troposphere. Decreasing the latitude of gradient of radiative cooling and enhancing GC. So that's what's happening in the tropics due to clouds. But what's happening in the poles? Uh, this cartoon represents middle troposphere temperature and radiative heating gradients, and this is the winter pole. And we see here that, we see here that there's strong cooling in the pole, uh, changing the sign of the temperature and heating gradient so that it's the same as the temperature gradient, and enhancing GC. Compare this to the clear sky profile here, the dotted line, and we see that we no longer have, without clouds, we no longer have this strong cooling that takes place at the pole. And instead, the heating gradient is opposite sign of the temperature gradient uh, throughout all latitudes, destroying available potential energy. Here's what's going on when this happens with a cloud. So in the clear sky case, the polar atmosphere is very cold, it's very dry, and it doesn't radiate effectively into space. So what happens is the surface radiates effectively, almost as a black body, not quite because it's snowy, uh, but almost as a black body. So a temperature inversion develops, and then there's a temperature gradient between the atmosphere, which is warm, and the surface, which is cool, and the atmosphere reduces heat to the surface by the surface sensible heat flux. And that's the normal cooling mechanism uh, without clouds present. But when clouds are present, they increase the emissivity of the atmosphere from the radiation to be emitted directly from the atmosphere to space, enhancing cooling and changing the sign of the longitudinal uh, gradient to radiative heating, reversing sign and enhancing GZ. How does cloud affect GE? Here we have December, January, and February, full sky minus clear sky GE, the same plot that we had before with our latitudinal and our height uh, effect. Um, once again, the lower troposphere is the, da the dashed lines, dotted lines are middle, and a dash dot is upper. The main effect that we see here is that clouds enhance GE from the middle and lower troposphere and the northern hemisphere winter mid latitudes. That's the strongest effect. And we also see that they enhance GE from the lower troposphere in the southern hemisphere, some of the tropics, and the mid latitudes. Uh, in general, full sky might. The full sky is larger than clear sky, and we see that clouds radiate the effect on GE strengthens the surface motion. Let's look at the spatial variability of the cloud effect on GE. This is BJF, mean full sky minus clear sky, GE. The first thing that we notice about this plot is that clouds enhance GE production in the northern hemisphere of winter storm dry. This cartoon explains why. So in the northern hemisphere in the winter, we have a temperature gradient between cool land and warm ocean. The preferential location of cyclones over the warm ocean region means that clouds are preferentially located. The warm sector of the, the wave is located over the warm ocean, whereas the non-cloudy high-pressure part is located over the cool ocean. So when clouds are present, they prevent radiative cooling to the warm uh, surface areas of the ocean and allow strong radiative cooling. The lack of clouds will have strong radiative cooling here, so that enhances the temperature gradient. In the clear sky case, we have effective radiative cooling of the warm ocean water, destroying the temperature gradient. So clouds suppress radiative cooling, and they enhance heat. Uh, you'll notice that 
here in the southern hemisphere, and this gets back to what you were saying uh, about the tracking. You see in the southern hemisphere, this is the southern hemisphere winter storm tracking, you don't see this kind of large enhancement by clouds. And the reason for that is that there aren't any uh, cloudy stationary features where the circulation organizes itself such that the radiative heating by the clouds, uh, cloud suppress radiative cooling preferentially over warm uh, regions. Uh, so the biggest positive effect, in fact, that we see during June, July, and August is here in the northern hemisphere, in the subtropical eastern Pacific, where clouds, the cloud suppress radiative heating here in the cool ocean and the warm land, clouds, low clouds, uh, marine stratocumulus clouds suppress radiative heating of the cool ocean. Enhancing the temperature gradient between the ocean and the land, and enhancing GE. Uh, there are some regions uh, around the world, particularly the tropics and the subtropics, where clouds inhibit GE production. And this happens because they're essentially preventing radiative heating of the surface, the warm surface, so they destroy the temperature in the cool ocean, warm land temperature gradient. Inhibit GE. So we see that the clouds alter the latitude, clouds alter the latitudinal and vertical gradient of radiative heating in a way that affects GZ. And there are indirect and direct ways that they do it. In the tropics, the deep convective clouds in the IPCZ reduce the radiative cooling from the lower and middle troposphere where the temperature gradients are large. They decrease the latitudinal <coughs> gradient of heating, and they move cooling away from the lower levels. And so we can represent that with this picture, where upward motion converting the other upward motion. Uh, mean radial circulation causes deep convective clouds to form. And these clouds have a radiative influence on GZ, enhancing GZ, which enhances the strength of the mean radial circulation, which enhances the upward motion, and so forth. We have a direct connection here between cloud radiative effect on GZ and the strength of the circulation. This is a different story at the poles. At the poles, clouds associated with synoptic systems, so that cloudy, clear state is determined by whether a storm is present or not present. Clouds associated with the synoptic systems enhance the radiative cooling from the middle atmosphere, and they change the sign of the latitudinal gradient of radiative cooling, enhancing GZ. Remember that happens by increasing the emissivity of the atmosphere, so that the middle atmosphere can cool strongly by radiation, uh, rather than transferring sensibly to the surface. Uh, even though we're moving uh, the cooling from the lower troposphere, which is normally where radiative effects have the greatest effect, uh, radiative cooling is more powerful means of cooling than sensible heat flux because it goes as much as t to the core as opposed to the heat. So clouds allow very efficient uh, radiative cooling in the poles. And here we see this sort of indirect connection between, uh, between the, uh, there's a connection between the eddy circulation and the mean circulation. Clouds associated with the eddy circulation, the presence or absence of storms uh, at the poles, enhance GZ, which supplies energy to the mean circulation. So not a direct fix at the tropics. Enhance GZ. Clouds alter radiative heating over the Atlantic Ocean. That's how they mostly affect GE in the northern hemisphere with latitude. Clouds associated with winter storms prevent radiative cooling from the lower and middle troposphere over the warm ocean water. In the picture, we have upward motion, but it's not uh, convective motion in the same way as the tropics. It's slantwise convection associated with barotrenic motions. It creates low thick clouds. These prevent radiative cooling near the surface, enhancing GE, enhancing the eddy circulation, and so on. So again, we have direct feedback between clouds and uh, the eddy circulation. Uh, whereas in the subtropics, Sinking air in the descending range. Remember, we saw that uh, in the land subtropical regions, clouds inhibit uh, GE, but they're not a very cloudy place compared to the oceans, where the sinking air makes uh, marine strata cumulus is very, very persistent. So, sinking air in the descending branch of the heavy cell encourages marine strata cumulus formation over the cool ocean, but it inhibits cloud formation over warm land that it helps maintain the land ocean temperature gradient in the subtropics. And so we see the clouds associated with the mean circulation, the clouds that are caused by the descending branch of the head itself, mean circulation, enhance GE and supply energy to the eddy circulation. So to summarize this part, we'll 
We still have a few minutes, I think, for the flower result. Uh, GZ is largest in winter, particularly in the southern hemisphere. That's because of the strong cooling from the pole to serve a central heat pump. The largest contributors to GZ are the surface of the western winter pole and latent heating in the southern tropics. But the latent heating contribution is less effective because it takes place in the upper troposphere, where temperature gradients are small. You see, surface sensible heat fluxes have a large impact despite their small magnitude because they happen when the temperature gradients are large in the lower troposphere. We found GE was negative. It was an order of magnitude smaller than GZ due to cancellation of opposite sign contributions. We see that GE is positive where latent heating and surface fluxes combine to overcome the negative radiative contribution, negative elsewhere. Um, that happens largely over the cloud that forced processes organized quasi-stationary features, such as the northern hemisphere of the latitude winter storm track, and the summer monsoon, which enhance the covariance between temperature and heat gradients. We've seen that clouds enhance GZ by preventing radiative cooling in the tropics and permitting radiative cooling at the pole. We've seen clouds enhance GE in the northern hemisphere of the latitude storm track. And so we can conclude that the circulation organizes itself, the large-scale dynamics, Organize itself such that the cloud effect on G increases the energy <coughs> available for the circulation. So this is the end of the schedule talk, but we have more. So before I go on, uh, I'd like to have acknowledgments. Uh, this work was supported by the grants. I uh, did this work as a graduate student uh, working with Bill Rosso. Uh, he provided a great deal of guidance and support. Most importantly, to Bill's supervision. And also, I'd like to thank my other committee members for their helpful uh, so I wasn't planning to talk about this today, but there were, that was just one chapter from my thesis, uh, but we have other, another chapter which I did not publish, uh, where we assessed uh, G, contributions to G in semen three models in current climate, the double CO2 climate, and we tried to get a sense of whether GZ and GE had uh, any relationship to climate sensitivities, so I will briefly go through these, and I apologize in advance if I'm a little disorganized because I didn't practice this at all, so uh, please forgive me. Feel free to interrupt. So I looked at these uh, seven different models. Um, I did not look at the GIST model, despite doing this work at GIST, because I was in fact missing uh, surface radiative flux during that I needed. Uh, I compared the GZ in the current climate, uh, the historical model, model runs uh, for the late 1990s, to uh, the G that I computed from observations. So observations are down here at the bottom. Uh, oh, and these, these numbers are different from the numbers that I showed you before uh, because the model results that were available to me were at monthly resolution. So I had to repeat my computations at monthly resolution. And also, I didn't have vertical profile information uh, where the heating goes. So I had to use columns. So that's why our numbers are different. And we see that uh, using no vertical profile information and monthly results really has a big effect. This is two point, this is 0.7 watts per meter squared larger than the values that we obtained using daily uh, four uh, levels in the atmosphere uh, computations. So yeah, this is why they're different. Uh, so this is the observation you can see. And we see that in general, the models have lower uh, GZ than uh, on the observation. Losing, uh, losing the profile info has the largest effect on GE, and losing the uh, daily information has the largest effect on GE. Okay. So models have less uh, variation, typically, than the observations we find. Uh, this plot, which you currently can't see, uh, is the uh, uh, model minus data GZ. This is DJF. This is JJA here. Uh, this is the total. This is the latent heating. And this is the surface sensible heat flux. So it turns out the differences between the models and the observations are due mostly to differences in their tropical latent heating and their polar surface sensible heat flux, which makes sense because those are the uh, two uh, places and heating terms that most affect GZ. Uh, so here's DJF. Uh, we see that there's it's kind of messy to look at. Um, 
we see that in general models have, I can't really see this, but there's, an there's a shift here in many of the models across the equator of uh, latent heat uh, in the shifts uh, into the summer hemisphere. So you can see there's a dip here. You probably can't see that. Uh, but many of the models uh, have a, a latent heating peak that's uh, in a different location than in the observations, uh, shifting um, toward the summer hemisphere. Uh, and also we see a similar thing that surface heat fluxes are uh, affected at the winter pole. And typically, uh, models have smaller surface heat fluxes than observations. Uh, radiant heating is often, most cases, uh, tropical uh, radiating. I'm sorry, tropical latent heating is mostly larger uh, in the models than the observations. Uh, models have larger GZ in the tropics, smaller GZ in the winter pole because of those two uh, differences in the diabetic heating terms that I just talked about before. Uh, so while the overall GZ values are roughly similar between models and observations, they don't get the same numbers from the tropics and the pole as we see in the observations. Uh, so here's GE, again, sorry, I apologize that you can't really see these. Uh, model G is mostly larger than observed G. This is the uh, model, this, all of these are model minus observations. This is GGF, this is GGA. Uh, we see that models mostly have larger GE than the observations, particularly in the summer subtropics, so here and here, and winter deep tropics, so here and here. And in the northern hemisphere, winter mid latitudes here. Uh, model GE, due to latent heat, shifts off of the equator, uh, which uh, turns out to be uh, significant for uh, 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 Low latitude model GE increases due to the surface fluxes overlap. So here are the surface fluxes, which are bigger in the model. And high latitude increases take place over ocean. So here's a summary of what I've done, uh, looking at uh, current climate model G versus observations. Uh, models have larger tropical latent heating, uh, enhancing GZ production there. They have much smaller winter polar surface sensitivity fluxes, lowering GZ. Polar flux differences overwhelm the tropical latent heating differences, so the model GZ is smaller than observed GZ. Model GE tends to be larger than observed, mainly due to surface sensible heat fluxes over low latitude land and high latitude ocean. And the low latitude differences between the models and the observations imply that the models have a stronger heavy circulation, which would increase GZ, if not for the compensating effect of reduced winter polar surface sensible heat fluxes. And then we looked at uh, double CO2 minus current climate model one. We wanted to see how G might change uh, in a warmer climate. Uh, so we see here, this is a, in general, so this is double CO2 minus current climate. So G is lower, up to about 10% at a global annual rate. Uh, northern hemisphere, GZ generally increases by up to about 10%, with some exceptions. There's a much larger decrease in the southern hemisphere, GZ, up to 35%. General or uh, GZ is lower in a warmer climate, which we expect because the temperature gradient is uh, expected to be much lower. Uh, again, I apologize for the uh, invisible plot. I'll try to tell you what these things all are. Uh, so this is the same as before. We had DJF. This is mean um, double CO2 minus current climate for each of the models. Uh, this is okay, I can't see. Uh, the latent heating contribution. This is the surface flux contribution. The same for JJA. We see that there's a cross equator shift to here. The latent, he the latent heating shifts here to here from the uh, northern hemisphere, deep tropics, into the southern hemisphere. Uh, especially in DJF, not as clear here in JJA. Uh, there's also an increase from latent heating in the high latitudes in the northern hemisphere and a polar shift in the southern hemisphere. The tropical changes are due to latent heating. Also, there's a warmer tro upper tropical troposphere in uh, the double CO2 climate. The high latitude uh, changes are due both to latent heating and the polar shift of the surface fluxes combined with the warmer pole. Uh, the effect on GE in a warmer climate in a double CO2 climate. 
this and don't do too much current clinic. This is it in general. GE is a little bit, is 10 to 20 percent lower in winters than the northern hemisphere winters, the southern hemisphere winters. So the changes in summer are mixed and are smaller, but it's not as big an impact on GE as there is in GE. It's the same plot as before. I'm just going to go through this. This is for the rain again. GE is larger in winter, high latitudes. Mostly due to surface sensibility plus and latency. The low latitude response is due to latent heating, which is a latent heating uh, difference, and so surface sensibility plus difference. And the high latitude response is dominated by the surface pluses here, and that's all that you see here in winter. To summarize the differences in the models between the doubled CO2 and the current climate, the larger and more concentrated tropical latent heating and warmer upper troposphere temperatures. So those cross equatorial shifts mean that there's a, a more concentrated band of latent heating in the tropics. Less cooling uh, by surface sensible heat pluses at the winter pole, which means that the temperatures are much warmer and also we have a sea ice loss there. Uh, so we have flux from the ocean in the northern polar region. That lowers GZ. Polar flux differences are overcome the tropical latent heating differences. So double CO2 GZ is smaller. G is slightly smaller in the double CO2 climate than the current climate. Low latitude differences between double CO2 climate and current climate imply intensified heavy circulation, although uh, the high latitude and high latitude differences between double CO2 and current climate imply widespread loss of sea ice, particularly in the southern hemisphere. Uh, after I put this on the slide, which I have not revisited since uh, my thesis defense I just added to you today, uh, I read some papers in particular uh, uh, Soden et al. in 2006 that suggested in fact that uh, heavy circulation is not intensifying and that in fact what I'm seeing is a result of uh, uh, the increased uh, water vapor content in the atmosphere due to heating. The dry areas are drying and warm, I'm uh, sorry, the dry areas are drying and the wet areas are getting more wet. Uh, so what I see, uh, so what I interpreted here as uh, strengthening of the heavy circulation is in fact a sign of uh, 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 hydrological cycle changes uh, due to increased uh, water vapor content. I also didn't talk about it here, but I also saw a broad theme of the uh, regions where the descending branch of the Hadley cell uh, influences the subtropical GE production. So those move forward, which is something that we would expect in a warm climate where the heavy circulation extends forward. Uh, so we wanted to see whether there's a relationship between GZ and climate sensitivity, if there's any way to distinguish between the different models of different climate sensitivities based on how well they represented GZ compared to the observations. Uh, and we didn't find any connection. Uh, so initially we tried just making a plot as a GZ as a function of sensitivity and a, a cloud that didn't see anything helpful. Uh, so we tried to stratify, and again I apologize, you probably can't see those. Uh, we tried to stratify the different models according to their uh, climate sensitivity. So the models, so the red models are low climate sensitivity, the green models are medium climate sensitivity, and the blue models are high climate sensitivity. And here's their uh, zonal mean GZ in December, January, and February, and in uh, June, July, and August, a double CO2 minus uh, current climate. Uh, so we wanted to see whether the changes in GZ uh, in a warm climate had any relationship at all to climate sensitivity. And you can see that there really is no relationship here. There's blue curves and red curves and green curves are all overlapping each other. There's no consistent pattern. Uh, we did find, uh, so we looked at, um, at the zonal mean temperature from the upper troposphere and also the uh, lower troposphere. Uh, and this is the zone in latent heating only. Uh, double CO2 climate minus current climate stratified by climate sensitivity. Uh, S is sensitivity. Uh, you see that the high sensitivity models have more intensified tropical latent heating. So you can see that the blue is a little bit higher here than the red and the green. And a larger cross equatorial shift into the southern hemisphere in response to double CO2 uh, in DJF. Th these are the uh, uh, common features that we saw in the high sensitivity models. 
So looking here at the upper uh, tropical upper atmosphere temperatures, we see that high sensitivity models have a larger warming in the tropical upper atmosphere using the blue curves up here, and the low sensitivity curves have uh, lower warming, uh, which affects GP production uh, when the latent heating, particularly when the latent heating shifts to become more uh, zonally concentrated. Uh, we also see, though, that there's no connection between the amount of polar amplification. So this is the change in uh, lower temperature, zonal temperature, uh, in response to double CO2. And you see it's all over the place. Some models have really large amplification, some models don't have a lot of amplification. There's no connection between sensitivity. Uh, and that's it. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
there are, I guess they're accepted employees. Okay. Um, yeah, for contractors, uh, we're not allowed to come in at all. We're not allowed to use NASA's fleet, including uh, the supercomputers and the FPCS. So Columbia is expected to work 